My guest today is an American film actor, stage actor, composer, and musician who is best known for his roles as Hedwig in Hedwig and the Angry Inch and Ernest Shackleton in Ernest Shackleton Loves Me, for which he won the Norton Award for Best Actor and was nominated for the Lortel Award in the same category. These days, he can be found buried in his neuroscience textbooks as a student at UPenn. My guest is Wade McCollum. I'm Aiden Nepom, and this is The Changed Podcast. Wade, thank you for joining me. I am so happy that you're here on The Changed Podcast. Aiden, thank you for having me. It's so good to see you. It's so good to see you. Um, So it's not unusual for me to speak to people that I already know on the podcast, but my listeners should probably know that we've known each other since we were kids. Yeah. (laughs) Little tiny Ashland kids. Little bitty kids in Ashland, Oregon. I don't think we met at school. I think we met in Lee Kitt's acting classes. Is that right? That sounds correct. Wow. Haven't thought about that in a really long time. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I'm pretty I'm pretty sure that's where we which is where I learned improv. Yeah. Wow. And improv is such an incredible, incredible discipline. It's been such a useful tool for basically yeah, life, I right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean it's well it's woven into the fabric of everything that I do. Um, but you went on the path of doing scripted polished professional works you know like um my listeners can go if they don't already know who you are can go look you up on broadway world or wikipedia (laughs) which i discovered as i was prepping for the show you have a (laughs) wikipedia page so you've been on the path of like really memorizing a lot of stuff (laughs) that is so true and memorization is it's like a muscle i remember when actually we were doing um speech and debate and there was like you know times where I had to memorize large, like what, 10 minute long chunks of plays or whatever. And I would try to like memorize it on the bus ride to the tournament. And I feel like at that moment, I like started for myself figuring out like the gym of memorization and like, what was my regime? And how did I, you know, follow the steps? And luckily, I got pretty good at it. Because especially in TV and stuff, you know, I've gotten to set on the morning of the shoot and they give you a brand new script, a brand new script. And you have to memorize it in your dressing room. And hopefully, you know, you have a little bit of time. Um, So it is sort of like one of those necessary superpowers, you know, for, for, for the actor who decides to go down the route of scripted stuff. Yeah. That's amazing. Do Do you still remember things that you memorized a long, long time ago? Or mm. does that do the do those files get rewritten like a computer? I do feel like I have a good delete system that things have to go in order for more to get in. That said, there are certain things that like dig a rut somehow. Mm-hmm. They're just like like almost like a the hook of a very popular song, but it happens right. to be a monologue or a, a a line from something, and it just kind of those things kind of rattle around for a longer period of time. But most of the time I'm good at just sort of like, you know, that's done. Let it go. I've done a little bit of scripted work here and there uh, in my adult life. And um, I I cannot remember a single line from any of it, but I can still remember um, songs that I had to memorize in middle school. Mm -hmm. I find that interesting. Right, that music is actually working. The audio cortex is so sophisticated that it it has a whole different wiring system for music than it does for language. I love that. Yes, and you are you have now dug deeply into the science of how music works in our brains. But before we get there, there's something that I wanted also the listeners to know, which is that you were one of my first five people that I booked to be on the podcast. So you were originally supposed to come talk to me. Um, at the very beginning of season one, and my plan was to launch episode one with uh, with Broadway actor Wade McCollum, and then <laughs> um, you had to cancel. Um, do you? Do, right, can we talk about that for a moment? I'm first of all, wow. I'm just psyched that you're now here and healthy and lovely and beautiful 
as always, but that was a scary time. It was terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. I was in New York city when, yeah, when everything got shut down and I did, I, I got COVID like most people in New York city, I guess. And it was really rough. And when we, when you contacted me, I had technically, you know, I was feeling pretty good relatively speaking, but there was this lasting effect where I, my voice wasn't operating in the way that it normally does. And it was because I make my, you know, my primary source of income is like my voice and my, I guess my face or (laughs) whatever, as an actor, (laughs) you are your product or whatever. Um, it was, it was so scary to not know if like my singing voice and my speaking voice would return to normal. Um, and so, yeah, I was exhausted and my voice was wonk. And I just thought, I don't know if this is the best offering I can give you at this time, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, I'll always tell people to prioritize health. You know, we had, we had an appointment book to talk and then you were like, I, um, I have to postpone because I'm sick and I'm a week out from being sick and I'm recovering, but I don't feel great. Let's touch base later. So I touched base with you a couple of weeks later and was like, how's it going? You were like, uh, like what you just said, technically I'm recovered, but the words you used were, um, but my voice sounds a bit like a frog. Yeah. I'm not sure I'm ready for radio. Yeah, I actually, my voice was like this and um, it wouldn't go further down. Like I couldn't get it to go down. And I I was like, wait a minute, I don't want to sound like Kathleen Turner for the rest of my life. I mean, for a moment, it can be really fun to be Kathleen Turner. Sure, sure. I'm really happy my voice has returned. Um, And it actually, I think, returned more like stronger and more flexible and The other reason that it felt sort of like not the moment to to share with you in a in a setting where change is the subject is because Mm -hmm. I felt as though I was in that very moment of like a fulcrum, both collectively and personally. And I couldn't because so much about, you know, the the notion of this was a life changing moment where everything turned it, it only in retrospect. Do we really understand how? it maybe fits into the scheme of things. And so I felt like I was in the middle of that sort of pirouette as it were. And so much was changing. Um, Right. I could see coming on and and being like, tell me a story about a moment in your life when everything changed in that moment would be super weird to be like, well, everything is different about me (laughs) right now, but let me tell you about when I was seven. Like, you know, like I can see how that would be kind of a weird ask. (laughs) Um, broadly speaking, when you think about change, just that I, the word itself or how you define it, what, what are some of the thoughts and feelings that show up for you around the broader concept of change? Mm, It's just one of my favorite containers, like big, like language concept archetype, like whatever you want to call it, the notion of change and the experience of transformation and change. I feel like because I spent the early part of my childhood on the road in a rock and roll band, my dad being a drummer, and I was born in California. And two weeks later, we were in Northern Alberta, Canada, and we never Mm -hmm. stayed in one place for more than two weeks. Change or most people's idea of change was so normal to me. I didn't know what regular, um, non, like, you know, non-changing lifestyles looked like because we were truly sort of these um, American troubadours that, you know, didn't stay put. So for me, it's been a foundational aspect of my being that I've had to sort Mm -hmm. of relate to in the outside. I feel like the the paradigm um, of, of the world, generally speaking, I've had to learn a lot about how change affects other people um, in a way that maybe is not like me because I was wired my 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 biology and my my neuro pathways were formed with so much your, change that... your nature and your nurture it sounds <laughs> yeah, like exactly exactly <laughs> so I love change I love it and I and I think you know the 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 frame with which we look out at the world 
um, it feels like the moments that I, when I'm, when the, the sort of prompt that you give us on your show, it feels like when that frame quite literally dissolves, burns, shifts, angles, breaks apart, and a new one arrives, or you're in the middle of building that new frame, that's sort of the moments for me is where I looked in my life, where the, the, the paradigm frame through which I was examining the world, quite literally, mm. everything changed because the, my lens of perception changed. Yeah, I think that's what intrigues me the most about this idea of change is it is the changes that we experience. My theory is, and you'll know more about this maybe, but my theory is that um, our experiences shape our views moving forward because how could they not? <laughs> you know, mm. if you've taken a, an evolutionary biology course in college or wherever, like very, very fundamentally a fundamental the very fundamental understanding there is that um our experiences what we survive um shape us uh, mm. not necessarily what doesn't kill you makes you stronger that actually sometimes things that don't kill you can make you weaker but mm. that they certainly shift you and your view of the world mm. um inevitably uh, a lot of the stuff that does that we do survive does in fact make us stronger in some way way just i just want to acknowledge that like there are some experiences they make make you stronger in some ways while other parts of you are changed in a way that feels weaker mm. so to speak mm. like that's that seems like reality absolutely yeah and that the the superpower maybe of the human is that adaptation that really really intelligent ability to adapt pretty quickly to radically different circumstances and environments and that part of adaptation is sort of allowing for the parts of one skill set or brain pattern to diminish or weaken while others sort of take over because out of necessity, that new system needs this set of tools rather than that set of tools. Like when somebody's lost their hearing, their eyesight becomes hyper acute or any other right. example of a deficit actually bringing a strength. I, I, I saw a quote recently, I should have written it down, um, that was, somebody was like, I get really upset when I see someone from my past and they tell me that I look exactly the same or that I haven't changed. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I was like, oh, I so really, I'm so really to that. I don't actually really resent much or, or get upset about much, but, um, I do relate to this idea that like, if somebody's looking at me and they go, oh, you haven't changed a bit. I'm mystified how they can perceive that to be true because I'm like, but clearly you're different. I mean, you know, what I mean? <laughs> like, why would yeah. I be an exception? Yeah. Um, there are things about me that have, that of course will remain through lines. Um, mm. But like, <laughs> I just, admit, I'm stunned when somebody can look, it's they're not looking at you when they say that they're looking mm. at they are literally looking at you um and seeing the past mm. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah it seems like part of i mean at least when i experience that but a lot of people don't say that to me because i think i do sort of i uh i age there are some people that i think on just on the surface level like you have really good genes you know what i mean <laughs> or whatever good bad whatever it's like you know, you, right? Because skin. we prize youth in this culture, so if, That's you, exactly if you are not right. aging, yeah, exactly. I was headed with like a youth, except you know, a youth obsessed culture is like they're trying to give you a compliment and be like, "You look great," but like <laughs> the truth is, we are an entirely different cellular system than we were the last time we saw them. If it's been seven years or whatever, right? So we've right. actually changed entirely. Wild. Wouldn't it be amazing if it was a compliment to look at somebody and go, my goodness, look how much you've changed. <laughs> Wouldn't that be wonderful? I love let's that. If, let's normalize that. Everybody, yeah. hashtag, you've changed. <laughs> I don't know. That's how you normalize something now, right? With a hashtag? <laughs> yes, that is that is the format of normalization. <laughs> okay, good. Because as a, as a middle-aged woman, I just want to do the internet right. <laughs> Oh, we're in such a weird one foot out, one foot in type moment. Like being our age, I feel like 
you know, half my life was spent without and half my life was spent with. And so I'm Mm -hmm. sort of like this weird bridge moment where I'm like, I don't know. I still feel like sort of like a baby with all this stuff and the kids where it's just, you know, this is the paradigm. Talk about frames of perspective. Right. Wow. Oh, the papers that that will be written about how this time period changed our children, how this time period changed everything. It's, I mean, yeah, this, this is going to be an interesting place in our history to look back on. Mm. Um, Yeah. yeah. I think now would be an excellent time if you are ready to share a story from your real life of a moment when everything changed. And we touched a little bit on, um, on the moment where you contracted and recovered from COVID. We haven't really talked about how that changed you. So I don't know if that's in the mix as well, but um, Mm. something you told me before we hit record is that this was a hard task that trying to pick one story felt challenging. Can you just talk a little bit about the process of trying to pick a single moment before you even share a story? Just absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, first of all, choosing superlatives of anything has always been a real deficit of mine. It's like linear time and I don't quite also get along very well or I don't somehow have the mechanism to quite grok linear time in the way that other people do. Same with the notion of superlatives. Maybe it actually goes with my my habit that I love, which is that I recognize the greatness or the merit in all of them. And that I don't understand what metric I'm using to choose the most or the best or the, because they all have the most best in a different way. So I, I somehow need to like, if I'm going to live in a world of superlatives or top 10 lists, I have to curate a metric for myself that makes sense to identify best, better, whatever those kind of, you know, layers of hierarchy are. So that's just Mm -hmm. like a weird, you know, thing about the way my brain is built or my personality has formed or whatever you want to say. But it was, (laughs) it was a wild and fun examination. It was a really cool sort of like rewinding through what's been a very adventurous life. And because it's been filled with a lot of adventure and sort of diving into unknown scenarios, There's just so many moments where everything changed. And the big picture takeaway for me was I didn't know in the moment necessarily that it was happening. It was only Mm. in retrospect that I was able to place it in a narrative linear sense that made sense that that actually was a huge paradigmatic shifting point for me, these fulcrum moments and so then from there, parsing through the, the lifeline or whatever, the story of my life, I sort of identified those moments. And it was really fun. And I felt like it was a very constructive exercise. And so thank you oh, for cool. the opportunity. Yeah, I, I have to be honest and confess that if I were asked to be a guest on my own show, it would be very challenging for me to pick a single story. Um, because like you, um, there are many moments that being said, there are a few moments that typically pop quickly Mm -hmm. to the surface before Mm -hmm. I like start traveling back in time through my own memory banks. Mm -hmm. Um, so if, you know, if somebody were to ask me in the moment and I didn't prepare, I have a story or two that would just pop out. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. But Are they the most impactful? Well, I don't, I could not say. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a beautiful ask from the world, Aiden. And I'm just so grateful that you're making this show for the world because it's, it's such a necessary and useful conversation for humans to have, especially in a moment, the black swan event that we're in of like, you know, punctuated equilibrium, whatever we want to call it. Like things are changing (laughs) quite, quite rapidly. And so, to, to dig in together and explore the idea of change is just so useful. So thank you for the offering. Yes, really absolutely. I, um, I agree. I think it's helpful to look back um, and notice how things have changed us and to notice that um, 
in shared experiences, what's really interesting is when people have shared experiences, for mm. some people, those are life-changing moments. And for mm. other people in that experience, it's just a thing that happened. Mm. Um, so our own unique filter on the world um, that both comes from the experiences we have also shapes how we process the experiences that we have. So I think that that's also mm. a very interesting dynamic in mm. the change cycle and human being cycle and how we write stories and all of the things. Yes. I think about that every day or eight times a week when I am doing a show on Broadway or around the country or whatever. And eight times a week, I'm up there quite literally doing what is a wonderful job, but it's sort of like, you know, after you've like on, like on Broadway did wicked for a year or so, you know, it becomes it becomes, you know, very regular. So just like go to right. Broadway and do a show. It's sort of like showing up at the office. You just happen to yes. put on weird clothes and dance around on stage in front of people. And for you, there's this sort of like cadence of very mundane. It's a very mundane mm -hmm. experience, though it's beautiful. And I don't mean to sound ungrateful. And it's always special somewhat. But there's a grind to it, like any job and any pattern. <laughs> you know, you kind of dig a rut and you're sort of in your job. You're doing your job. And yeah. then I... Every single show, I, I'm up there thinking, you know what? There's 3,000 people watching the show right now. And with Wicked specifically, half of them are like 11-year-old girls. And their life is <laughs> totally changing because Wicked is awesome. And it's about this girl who like stands up to the, you know, the authority figure. She questions what's going on. She makes radical choices. She follows her heart. And she rebels in this responsible way. And she cares for the animals. And it's just like... I can feel them changing their, their lives. They're, they're having that fulcrum experience where they may never be the same. And I'm literally at my office job. <laughs> and the, the, the <laughs> juxtaposition of that is so incredible. And so it, to me, it encapsulates what you just said, that one person can just be having a conversation or, you know, they're just yeah. doing something that didn't really alter them. They happened to say something that for the other person on the other end, their entire paradigm shifted, which brings me to my first change or uh, paradigm anecdote. Um, Wonderful. Let's do it. So for me, I, because I was born into rock and roll, um, the first five years of my life, I didn't stay anywhere more than two weeks. And because we know that, you know, when you're born into something, the assumption is that's life. That's, life and there's no other you know there's no other way to do it because that's the way it's done and your parents do it and the band does it and people have different cars that they drive from place to place and they sleep in different cars or different hotels but and they play different instruments but everybody's moving around and playing gigs because that's how it is to be a person so that was sort of my inherited um understanding of the world and I had formed a very, oh, the other thing about me, for some reason, I have an inordinate amount of early childhood memories. And because when we're young, our brains are so plastic and we are in such a dynamic, somewhat tumultuous, changing, ever changing sort of, you know, there's a lot of dynamism in those early years in terms of the brain and how it's evolving, that I have a ton of anecdotes from my early life that feel so fundamentally um appropriate for this conversation. This one was by far the biggest. So I'm about three. I'm about three and we are in Nebraska and my father <clears throat> and my mother go to a yellow house in this sort of rural part of Nebraska. And, you know, they're rock and rollers. So, you know, <laughs> they probably went there for, um, you know, to, to, to buy some Medical marijuana. Medi medical marijuana was what they were looking for, probably. <laughs> um, they were going there for whatever it was they were going there for. And we showed up and I didn't, I wasn't around a lot of kids because I was with a band of adults. Well, <laughs> they were also kids, but they were older kids. Um, you know, they uh, <laughs> acted like children, but they were actually adults. And so I didn't have a lot of experience with smaller people. And there was this kid named TC. <clears throat> and he was cool. He was friendly. And my parents were like, oh, go play in the backyard, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay. And we went out to the backyard and TC was like, oh, you know, what, what are you doing? And I was like, oh, I don't know. We just got here and Nebraska's hot and it's kind of humid. And 
you know, it smells like corn. He was like, yeah, well, you want to eat some cat food? And I was like, I have never tried cat food. And, <laughs> and you know, we're three, whatever. And, and I, you know, I've always been sort of open to adventure. You know, I'm curious. I was like, sure. I, part of me knew that, like, I probably shouldn't eat cat food or a lot of it. So I was like, I'll taste it, you know, I'll give it a taste. But he's chomping, like, he's chomping like it's, you know, I don't know what those, like, packaged snacks are. Um, you know, crunch, he's just crunching away. He obviously loves it. So I tried one, and I, um, it was salty, it was metallic, it was all the things that this kind of, you know, cat food is. I kind of pretended to be like, oh, that's good, because I could tell he loved it, so I didn't want to offend him. And we kind of had that experience, and I was like, okay, cool, well. And then, for some reason, we left. So we leave, and a year goes by, and we've been all over North America, all over North America, you know, a litany of different places and people and environments and contexts and, you know, all sorts of change. And we return a year later to that same town in Nebraska. And my dad, of course, goes to that same house, <laughs> probably for the same purpose. And they go inside and they're like, oh my, and TC comes out of the house. And I was, I was like blown away. And I remember freaking out. I was like, oh my God, you're here too. That's amazing. And I was like jumping up and down. And I was like, because I was blown away that the, what were the chances that we would both be at that house at the same time again? I just couldn't fathom how, you know, because he's doing this and I'm doing this. And then we came back at the same moment and now we're at that same house. I couldn't believe the synchronicity. And I was so enthusiastic. <laughs> and of course, we go into the backyard and he's like, what? What do you mean we're here at the same time? And I was like, well, you know, we've gone all over and he picks up the cat food and you know, he starts chowing down on the cat food. I was like, oh my gosh, he's doing this again. And so we kind of were doing a similar thing while conversing. And he's like, what do you mean we're here at the same time? And I was like, you know, we've gone everywhere, been all over the place. And how, what are the chances that we're back in this house at the same time together? And and he said, he just didn't understand what I was talking about. And eventually he said, oh, I, I've, I haven't left. And I, I, um, I didn't know what he meant. And I said, well, what do you mean? And like, what, what do you mean you haven't left? And he said, I live here. And I'd never heard somebody say that. And I, I didn't know what he meant. And I said, what, what do you mean you live here? And it took me a long time to figure it out that he's, he, he kept having to explain that he had not left that house other than to go to the grocery store with his mother for an entire year. And once I put it together, I thought something was terribly wrong. And I burst into tears because I thought they were keeping oh, no. him captive. Like there was something really wrong with it. Like, because my worldview was so different. I thought they were like, he was in jail or something. Like I just couldn't comprehend how that could be okay or ethically appropriate. And I ran back into the house and I was a mess. And my parents were like, what's going on? What's the matter? And I explained that TC had told me that he lives here. And I was really distraught about it. And they, of course, had to dig down a little, well, you know, what, what, what about that is, is disturbing. And I was like, well, why, you know, why did they keep him here all year? And I saw on their faces, they like went, oh, and they kind of like laughed. And then they were like, oh, Wade. Oh, like they got it. And they said, we're the, we're the different ones. Most people live in a house mm. and they stay there. And no, most people don't move around like we do and go from town to town. And this, like that frame thing, everything just went. And suddenly I was, I was the anomaly and everything else was, everyone was staying mm. And it was so fundamental, I could feel my brain change. And I have to say, I felt this sense I'd never felt before of like, it was depression. I felt depressed for the world or like what I perceived the world to be because how boring, like I couldn't comprehend 
a world where people stayed put and that it would it would be fun or exciting or good for them and it really to this day <laughs> is hard for me to grapple with and i've of course lived my life in a way that is you know ubiquitously traveling that's how i am i'm always moving so i obviously carried that with me too and um i think for me that was like one of the big fundamental changes in my perception of reality so drastically in a moment that um that wow. it feels it feels like a peak a peak experience of change for me i I have had those experiences where the world felt like it tips up upside down for a moment and then sort of comes back into as your I, I like how you phrase that you could feel your brain change mm. because it's like yeah the whole all of a sudden the world tilts upside down and and you realize you're the exception in the room mm. um and that what you thought was true is different but I'm also struck by this image of this kid this Poor TC. I wonder how TC grew up because like his routine was to go hang in the backyard and eat cat food. And that remained true after your travels and reuniting in this house where he lived. Um, like, I wonder how long that went on. <laughs> I think about him so often. It's so funny you say that. Cause I, I, he comes up a ton in, in, in my memory space and my sort of wondering space and, I often imagine how his life unfolded and and I've encountered many TCs along the way as you can imagine mm-hmm. that and and I've really learned to honor that the sort of diversity of belonging that mm-hmm. you know, belonging mm-hmm. is such an important element to being a human and and because of that and because of our in, incredible adaptation skills as a as an organism we have this diversity of belonging and I've really learned to honor everyone's sense of belonging though, not my own. I don't feel Mm. depressed anymore because I feel like I've gained empathy and true understanding for that. Some people really feel way more comfortable staying and doing a routine. And that's, that's way more a sense of belonging for them. And I, I, I really honor that. And, so part of me imagines a, a very positive outcome where he he's used those long roots in Nebraska to inherit the family farm. And he maybe is in that same house and his kids maybe are in the backyard, you know, <laughs> trying out some new cat but food. Everybody's but, trying new cat food. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. And they're happy. You know, it's like, I don't, I want to think they're happy. And I everything. love that idea. I mean, who knows? Maybe his ability to really taste the differences in cat food has let him could have let him down a a cat food manufacturing path, <laughs> and maybe my cats eat food that he developed. You're right. He could have. He could be like a micro tuning for the allergens in cat food, and now he's like <laughs> built a cat food brand empire that's all about the health and the microbiome of the feline population. I that is anything also is possible. possible. Anything is possible. <laughs> Uh, oh my god wow yeah wow you said that you had trouble choosing that you had like four stories do you want to share a second story i I can give you space for a second story but i will tell you that that story um is (laughs) (laughs) it's a a tasty story (laughs) Is it salty and metallic? Is there a- it's a salty and metallic example, <laughs> and I feel I feel um, I feel satisfied with that story. But uh, <laughs> I'm snorting, I'm snorting. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, I also I also want to honor that that you gave so much thought and think in like coming up with a story yeah. to bring. I, and the other thing I that I want to say though that it occurs to me is like. Okay, so in thinking about what story to share, you, you're picking and choosing, right? But as an audience member, I hear a story and I'm like, thank you, that was a wonderful story. And there's no like need or compelling, like the, uh, the audience generally speaking, this is true in musicals, this is true in television, this is true in whatever, the story they get is the story mm. that they think about. And the only thing that you really see fans talk about of like, 
who are really nerding out about something is how to make the story they just heard a better story as opposed to <laughs> that's not a story that I wanted. I wanted a different story altogether, unless it's a finale for a TV series, right? So in which case then Ooh, people yeah, have really specific totally. thoughts about how that story should go. Um, yeah. But for the most part, huh. like we watch a movie and we're not like, that's not the story they should have told. We're like, I, you know what? I wish they, they would have made this one, the villain, or I wish they would have fed this thing just a little more. Um, yeah. And that's something very interesting that as we share our stories with the world, the world's like, thank you. I heard a story and now I know who you are, <laughs> you yes. know? And yet our experiences internally are so complex and filled with multiple stories and all of the things. Oh, I love that. I love this. Yeah. That humans as a species, again, are like story eaters and that we, oh, yeah. that we, Rather than like throw the story up, this is a gross analogy, but like rather than throw it back up, we like <laughs> like digest that cat it. food, like that cat yeah. food exactly. Which is why he made hypoallergenic cat food. Um, yeah. <laughs> I feel like instead of throwing it up, our tendency is to digest it, and in that process yes. of digestion, there's that refinement where we're like, what nutrients am I going to take from that story that are useful to my particular lens and narrative? what I'm thinking about, how I'm looking at the yes. world right now and what I'm working on. And that's such a beautiful and incredible gift as a, as a human species. What an amazing thing. And to not be like, well, I wish I would have told a different story, but to have the ability to parse it apart and digest separate nutrients. And then maybe thinking in our own terms, like, well, I would have, you know, I would have enjoyed it if the villain was more this way, that way, or the other thing, because for my particular you know, the way I'm looking at the world right now, that would have been more useful or it would have been a better story. So totally. Cool. Totally. And I guarantee I like you, as someone listened to that story, they also heard uh, their own stories pop up about kids they met when they were traveling, about trying cat food. Because I know you're, <laughs> you're not the only one and neither is TC. Um, though I haven't yet. Oh, you haven't. It's never too late. <laughs> it's never too late. <laughs> you know, and I have actually... I had that thought <laughs> as I'm giving the cats their food and they're like, I don't like this one. Or they're like, I really like this one. I have had the thought. It's never too late to find out what the difference is between these choices. Fancy um, feast. For myself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But then I, but I can't, they really mm -hmm. like the stuff that really grosses me out. So I just, I think for me, the trying the cat food train is, has probably left the station. <laughs> Well, so, maybe next time we'll but find out. Never say never. Yeah. Yeah, maybe in my next life. <laughs> I, I you know, or maybe in my past life I already know and that's why I feel You know what that's like, it. When I, here's a funny story. I'll tell you, here's a true story. So when I was uh 3 and a half or 4, mm. I have a vivid memory of um we lived here in Portland at that time and I have mm. a vivid memory of sitting on the steps with my parents and looking at um, those, they're like, they look like grapes, but they're flowers. Those little, I have to look them up what they're called, mm. but they grow here in Portland through these like, they look like little tiny bunches of grapes. Yeah. Flowers. And I'm staring at these flowers and I, and I turn to my parents and I say, I was a cat in my past life, just sort of like out of the blue. <laughs> and, and my parents being hippies, um, did not go, no, you aren't, or that's not a thing. They were like, tell, you know, oh, how do you know? Yeah. You know? And I said, because I have excellent night vision and my <sighs> vision during the day isn't as good. <laughs> and also I remember being a cat. Oh my gosh. I love that. <laughs> and they were like, they were like, okay. And I held on to that narrative about myself, like for a good chunk of my childhood, I was a cat in my past life. I was a cat in my past life. And then in middle school, I started having dreams um, of being uh, in the, in the Holocaust, uh, very wow. vivid dreams. Um, and I wasn't me in those dreams. I was another girl who had two sisters. And, and then I was like, maybe I'm a Holocaust survivor. And also then like was a cat. I don't know how, what's the order? How does this work? So 
Um, and also maybe past lives are a farce. And and the thing is, the coolest thing of all is I have no way in this world and existence of knowing. I can only make mm. a choice about whether or not I think it's true. Uh, that is so true. I love that so much. And that's like the, the surrendering to the mystery and enjoying, enjoying the mystery. <laughs> and then understanding yeah. that we have agency in perspectives and and also that time for me is so non-linear there's this non-linear aspect and quantum entanglement piece that where there's this sort of simultaneity so in terms of like mm. past or future lives i get very jumbled up um mm. because it feels from a place of feeling that it's all just happening and Ooh. some memories are actually They've, they've turned out to be future events. So I get very, um, I just get confused. It feels way more spherical or, you know, tutorial. Like the geometry of time does not feel like a line to me. So to put things on this, like, you know, timeline, I get very uh, yeah, jumbled wow. up. Wow, that's so cool. Oh, that's so neat. Because I am a very linear thinker. But I do have snapshots of of things that haven't, happened or or don't happen or happen in ways that uh that i didn't expect i do have an anecdote that's quicker and it feels like it's sort of in alignment with what we're sort of talking about and in some ways it feels like uh it feels like the inverse of the previous anecdote for me um experientially well i definitely i definitely want to hear it so share i think it would be fun to hear um hear a second story from you so let's have that yes please Thank you. So I was 19 or 20 and I had graduated. I graduated college at 19. I had been working acting wise pretty rigorously for the year out of college. I had played Danny Zuko in Greece in LA. And then I went and I played Hamlet right after that. And it was quite a um, gear shift, <laughs> shall I say? Like my psyche was like, whoa. And I, it felt jarring um, to go from Danny Zuko to Hamlet. And it was also 1999. So we were at the turn of the century. And you know me and my relationship to time. So the whole thing was like bizarre. And everybody was freaking about Y2K. You know, I was in Portland and we were like, the world is definitely ending. And I was like, yeah, that could be a possibility. And then a group of my friends were like, let's go to Hawaii for the turn of the century. And I was like, that sounds like a perfect place to be. Fruit grows on trees. And I had a hundred bucks and a backpack and I air hitched to Maui. Now that's not a thing anymore. It was a hitchhiking ticket for 90 Mm -hmm. bucks and you could go on any airline that had a free seat. You just showed up at the airport. Miss those days. I hitchhiked on an airplane to Maui. And when I got into Maui, I realized, you know, wow, there's, I'm sort of a new, I was very outside of my um, context. Like, well, I could redefine myself. People there were changing their names and I was teaching yoga and I was like, I should change my name. That's what I need to do. And I decided for the turn of the century, I was going to fly to Kauai and hike to the end of the Napali coast for the turn of the century. So I got my backpack and I flew to Kauai and I thought to myself, I'm going to change my name today. I'm going to change my name today. And as I was flying there, I was like, I'm, I'm changing my name to Neptune. Um, my name is Neptune. And, you know, I'm a Pisces. I obviously grew up in Ashland and on the road. And so, you know, the notion of changing one's name to Neptune wasn't so strange. And I thought, yeah, that feels right. Neptune McCullum. <laughs> and so I was like, that's the decision. And I got off the plane and started my new life had my backpack on walked outside the airport and um got to a little bend in the road put my thumb out and first car pulled over picked me up hey brother where are you going it's like oh i'm going um to the napali coast just on the north shore and they were like oh cool we can take you as far as kapa'a and i was like sounds great thank you so much get in the back seat put my backpack in and they're like oh so where you come from oh maui and no, no, no. He said, what's your name, brother? And I was like, here's the big moment. This is when everything changes. 
And I was like, Neptune. <laughs> and he and I was like, yeah, that's totally true. <laughs> and he like adjusts his rear view mirror and he goes, Wade? <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. No joke. <laughs> and I thought, oh my gosh. Like the one I was like, no, 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 Neptune. I I thought I was changing everything. And he goes, Oh my gosh, Wade, I saw you play bottom in Midsummer Night's Dream at Ashland High School a few years ago in Shauna Cooper's what? production, and you were brilliant. I'll never forget that production and your performance, Wade McCollum. And I was like, if that's not the oh universe, my God. just like, you will not change your name to Neptune, <laughs> child. <laughs> your name is Wade. It's good enough. I don't know what is. So it was like a moment where I was like, and everything's going to change. And then it didn't. <laughs> it just <laughs> stayed the same. <laughs> and yet it was, you know, December 31st, 1999. So also everything changed. Wow. Wade, that's amazing. <laughs> Kauai is a, I have, <sighs> I have my own um, things changed and stayed the same in Kauai stories. That was a magical place. And then to Poly coast specifically, I, um, I backpacked and, and camped on the Nepali coast and I met strangers and had adventures. And it's, um, I don't know what it's like for a person in your twenties these days, but when mm. I was in my twenties, it was filled with magic and possibility. I, I am, I am in love with that story because even though your name did not change to Neptune <laughs> in that moment, <laughs> I am very curious. Did your relationship to your name, to Wade, did it change? Because it sure, sure as heck sounds like it did. Sure as heck. <laughs> it sure as heck did, Aiden. <laughs> it, <laughs> it, it sure did. Yeah, I, I, it was a moment of acceptance because I, I felt not, I don't feel uh, adverse to my name, but I don't, I feel sort of indifferent to actually the idea of names in general. I kind of like time don't quite get it. It's like, I guess I'm called that, but I don't see why. Like, I don't quite understand yeah. it. And it, do, it seems disconnected to me from who I am um, on some other fundamental level. And so for me in that moment, it was, it was both a personal and professional realization that whether I'd liked it or not, I had like, oh, it's so gross. But I had branded myself as Wade McCollum, mm. as an actor, as my career choice. Yeah. And that it was in a way too late, though I was still young, to sort of reverse that choice. And then in doing, in making that realization and the importance and the sort of central core of my life being my career and my my artistic, um, you know, motivating movement through life or whatever, that I um, I accepted that and and learned to not just feel indifferent to the name Wade, but um, embrace the fact that it is a verb. And that it's water based and it means mm -hmm. to walk through a river, you know, to to forge through yeah. a river. And and then I was like, oh, that is Nep like, you know, what I wanted from Neptune is already there, you know, in a way. <laughs> I mean, it's not the god of the ocean, but <laughs> it's less hyperbolic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so lovely. Well, I want to um, thank you for sharing that story. I'm so glad that you did. That's um, I'm the wonderful story. Um, and such a vivid image. And I just, what are the odds that that person who picked you up is somebody who saw it? Just amazing. Um, mm. Do you believe the universe sends you signals, communicates to you, feeds you pathways? Are you of that mind? Or do it's you undeniable. In coincidence? Do you believe in fate? I, I know synchronicity. I know synchronicity. It's like, you know, if there's one thing I know, it's synchronicity. And I can't say it is true for everyone. I would never make such a statement. But for myself, I get clear signals. And whether that's me, you know, it sort of goes with the past life conversation, whether that's me interpreting them and sort of appropriately putting them in my narrative to use them for my own sort of evolutionary purpose or intent. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But is it does it matter in a way? It's like, that was a very clear sign. And I took the sign and I listened. And there have been <laughs> multitudes of those throughout throughout this life. Yeah. It's wonderful. Thank you for sharing all of that. 
Uh, I want to talk a little bit, if you're willing, I want to spend just a little bit of time on the really cool stuff that you're currently into, which you, sh- I, we've talked a little bit about it offline. And I'm wondering if you would share uh, with the listeners, some of what you are mm. learning and doing. It's very Absolutely. cool stuff. And I'll stop talking so you can start. Oh, I, I'm, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Um, I am. I'm also curious and intrigued by what I'm up to right now. Um, I've always felt like a scientist, even as an actor and as an artist. I feel like I I applied unawarely. I didn't know I was doing it, but I was applying the scientific method rigorously to my own acting work and my own directing work, my writing. Um, it's a tool I've always used, but it's never been properly um, contextualized. And I've always had this note, this idea that had I grown up in a different um, financial setting or whatever, you, you know, different childhood, that I would have had access to education in a different way and that I mm. could have taken a very different route. I, I was like really into math and physics and I really always felt like I sort of the train left the station around third grade when I was I, like g- they gave us a, a math folder. I went to the algebra folder because it was like a you know, self, self, uh, timed learning thing or whatever. And I just loved it. I couldn't get enough of it. And I had to stop at algebra and wait for everybody else to catch up. And by that time I'd sort of found storytelling as a place where I could explore at my own pace in a way that kept me engaged. And so I was on a different train. Um, and I've always wondered like, what would I have been as a scientist and the, the, you know, this past year and all of its incredible, you know, radical severance from the patterns that we were used to as a people. Um, Specifically, my career is public and it's crowds and it's traveling. So it's like all the Mm -hmm. things that stopped. And so I had to make some pretty bold choices. And it was the excuse I'd been looking for to explore my science brain and to like explore these other pathways that I had sort of tertiarily been examining and looking at. And a few years ago, I did meet um, my friend Yasmin and co-founder, and she was at the runway program at Cornell Tech, which is a really incredible program for people to do their postdoctoral research and commercialize it into a a tech startup, essentially. And while she was um, beginning that process, we had had been having conversations about music and the power of how music affects the brain. And this is all of her um, PhD research as well, ethnomusicology and how we've co-evolved with music as a species. Um, and it's a really, really powerful, powerful medicine. And I've always experienced that, obviously, from the time I was little, that that's just, I just lived in the soup of music, so I didn't know anything else. And then being a musician and composer and all of that, I'd felt it, but I'd never analyzed it in the way that she had and looked at it from a brain and behavior and a a computational neuroscience perspective. So we had all these very rigorous muscular conversations around neuroscience and music. And we, I I felt like two sides of coin of a coin meeting where I was like, Oh, she did all the things I didn't get the chance to do. She went to all the amazing Ivy league institutions and did all the studying. And I did all the sort of like, on boots on the ground, experiential um, stuff. And so we sort of co-ideated um, some really fun, fundamental concepts around music and healing, which she spun into a company at Cornell Tech, this runway program. And right when the year hit and everything changed and uh, shows got canceled, she was at a point in the company's evolution where she was sort of ready to take on you know, the invitation for me to be a full-time contributor and not just a co-founder was there. So I, I started working for this neuroscience and music company tech startup and it was just off to the races. And it's been this extraordinary year of learning at an exponential rate. I cannot tell you how much I've learned. I'm also studying neuroscience, like you said, at UPenn, which is just like a dream come true. It's, I just can't, tell you how incredible it feels. It's like a brain massage. <laughs> and, uh, and I get to apply all of my, <laughs> my research and discoveries and experiences to technology that can help people. And we're really looking at music as a, as a very sort of precision medicine tool for mental health. And, um, and we're not alone. There's a huge, huge tidal wave, a surge of interest and 
uh, resources that are being poured into looking at music as medicine from the National Institute of Health and all sorts of, you know, large organizations. So we're, we're sort of on the front edge of that wave. And I feel like we, we've built a really good surfboard and it feels really fun. We're like, we're on the, we're on the ride and it's cool. We just met with the FDA yesterday and it's just really exciting. So that's one. And then the other is Pet oh Base. Pet Base is a, a company that uses the same recommendation engine and algorithms um, to match people to pets um, that would be appropriate for their lifestyle, what? their particular brain and behavior patterns. And people are often like, wait a minute, what? Medical music and pets don't understand how they fit together. But the thread <laughs> is actually it's quite clear that the coevolutionary pattern of uh, human beings evolving with music also happened with mm -hmm. companion animals. And so we are actually neurobiologically wired to really be intimate with um, music as a as a as a place to um, you know modulate our brain and and companion animals too serve a very similar function in the release of endogenous opioids and so it's this wow incredible... oh my gosh that's amazing um I'm thinking about this past year in relationship to both music and pets um, because this past year has been fascinating in that we've been all of us got sent basically to spend inordinate amount of amounts of time with our companion animals yeah um, and there were all these memes about like you know how cats and dogs got together and secretly put together a virus <laughs> so that they could have more of our time totally. um which feels right totally. uh, but also but also we were told not to sing um, and not to sing together. Yes, because oh. of the example, because of the, ex I mean, in terms of sent, being sent indoors, certainly sing in your house. My cats don't yes. let me sing in my house, but um, <laughs> uh, I'm like, I've been paid to sing, cats. cats. Keep your criticism to yourself. <laughs> um, but, you know, but it's interesting because of the, you know, what happened with the choir in Washington State at the yes. beginning of the pandemic this like healing act of singing wow. in unison was squashed. Yes. Um, and I'm, I've been fascinated by that. And as you're talking <sighs> about music and healing, I'm just like, what has, what are the, again, they're going to write so many papers down the road. I, I don't, I don't envy anybody in a decision-making place about who was like, you should do this and you should not do that because they're just trying to make the best decisions they possibly can. Mm -hmm. There will be papers written about that, about Oof. what was the effect of, of squashing our voices for a year. Wow. I had not really even thought about, I mean, I'd thought about that what? because I, I sing in public for a living, but, but right, right. from an about, economic standpoint. Yeah. Like the, the, the more global or humanistic, implications mm -hmm. of not being able to sing in groups and quite literally harmonize that that right. that powerful entrainment the powerful the powerful neurochemical release that happens when we sing in groups i i had not really put that together and that is it i bet it absolutely i mean the, the sense of isolation and atomization and the you know, this despair, I think, if anything, if any positive takeaway, it's that we realize the extreme import of mm. cohabitating, of collaborating, of harmonizing, of making music and making things in real time together with other animal humans in the same space, you know, that it, it's become very clear that it's a necessary thing for us, or for me anyway, I should say. Yes. Me too. Me too. Well, um, I feel like we could probably spend another hour just talking about the neuroscience of music and healing. I'm very curious, but I am aware of our time. So I'll just ask you, is there a place where people can learn more? I know that you're in the very early stages of all of this stuff. Hmm. The, so Pet Base um, is an app and we're, I, we're releasing the app imminently. I would say within a week, I literally just sent off the the graphic i'm like learning like basic graphic design for app design and we sent off the yeah. apps for people to click on the pets and i'm just doing the basic design structure for this first iteration of the app it looks great i think it's going to well, come that's out great. in a week so by the time okay so by the time this episode is out right now people there will be links uh and yeah. if people want to download the app they can get that app right now 
What about the neuroscience and healing music brain candy stuff? <laughs> Candy's the wrong word. Brain avocado. I don't know. <laughs> Oh, no, that's a thing now. Hashtag brain avocado. (laughs) It feels nourishing as a rhetorical phrase. Brain avocado. It feels brain avocado. That's Uh delicious. Quick, Quick, Aiden. Copyright brain avocado. Trademark. Trademark. (laughs) Aiden Nepal. 2021. Is it 2021? I think so. I believe so. I am not. I would have to look it up. Yeah. I'm. (laughs) flabbergasted by the notion of years going in sequence. <laughs> um, the, 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 the neuroscience and music company is a little bit more in stealth mode. Um, mm-hmm. But the thing to know is by the time we release this, there may be information that's publicly accessible. And we are, we are at a really cool point in the process of getting ready for commercialization of a wellness version of what we designed to be a medical product. So the wellness or consumer facing product of the medical music is going to be similar in nature, but the way it deals with patient privacy and data and all Mm. of that is very different. And um, so it's working on, it's leveraging the same concept and um, essentially doing a very same, the very same thing, but wellness context and consumer products are very different from the medical context. So we're sort of in the moment mm-hmm. where we're going into phase two clinical trials for the medical version of the music product. I see. And we're in this very cool and amazing conversation with our CFO and the guy who is leading our commercial um, rolling out process in terms of like, hey, yeah, how do we build a a consumer facing product that's more wellness oriented. Interesting. And so just quickly, the medical music itself addresses what in the body? What are you able to address in the body using medical music? So we, for our first um, phase clinical trial, chose anxiety um, to address uh-huh. specifically, um, mostly because of its ubiquity and um and it is a really crippling, it's a really crippling uh, pattern that goes on in the brain anxiety. And the, the population set that we chose to engage with, are, um, their anticipatory anxiety specifically is quite extreme. They're um, interstitial lung disease patients at Weill Cornell. And um, so their pulmonary function tests are extraordinarily painful. And you can imagine mm-hmm. that before engaging in a very necessary but extremely painful process, the, the you know it's like if you don't like getting a shot, you know you you know the body sure. starts you start to sweat and you're like adrenaline kicks in and you have all of these sort of anticipatory responses to the future event that are actually those anticipatory responses in many ways are often worse than the event itself. Yes. Like the event, the shot isn't that bad, but it's actually the lead. This the anticipatory anxiety that's actually the suffering. And so we were like, how do we address okay. that? And so we designed, um, and Yasmin is just, you know, she's like a hyper, she's a hyper genius and she's, she's a, she's a really incredible unicorn. And, um, her work on that study was incredible. And the results from the study were overwhelmingly positive. And, um, and so that's, that was the first sort of brain and behavior pathway we chose to address was anxiety but it it music because of our coevolution with it and the complexity of our um, audio cortex music can be used with precision to really um, address almost all all you know we can really modulate the brain in very specific ways with music well that's exciting when you are ready to enroll people for a study on um pain relief related to arthritis, you give me a call and I will (laughs) sign right up. Yes. We just had that conversation yesterday. That's so funny. Fantastic. You're on it. Awesome. Um, well, well, let's bring, we're going to bring our conversation now to a a lovely and gentle close. Um, even though I just want to keep talking to you forever and ever. Um, the, as people are listening to this conversation, what do you think it would be nice for them to take out of, or what are you taking out of our conversation today? What's your like 
takeaway or what would you like people to take with them? Oh, I, um, I have no agenda for others takeaway other than perhaps <laughs> my intent that people, um, use any story really to, to augment one's curiosity, that, mm. that curiosity and the sense of possibility, um, feels like you know the change and curiosity and adventure and courageousness those are those are generally wishes i have for all people to to have fun with thank you wade this has been absolutely wonderful thank you to you following this conversation is what stories popped up those moments in your own experience when you could almost feel your brain changing live in that moment as your understanding of the world shifted i call these gray hair moments and that may not be a great name for them but they are those moments that mature you when you realize that something you assume to be true isn't necessarily true like wade's story of coming to the shocking for him realization that some people just live in one place for their whole life. A lot of us have had experiences that changed how we view the the rules and the truths of the world in which we live. One such moment for me came in my late 20s when I realized that though my parents are wise and knowledgeable, they are not in fact experts at all things. And like the rest of us, that they are just, you know, shockingly human and doing the best that they can. What about you? What were your moments that changed the way you perceived the world around you? Come share your thoughts, stories, sarcastic remarks, and reactions to this episode in our Facebook group, www.facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash change hub. And be sure to check out the show notes for links and resources at our website, thechangedpodcast.com. Thank you for listening to The Changed Podcast. Special thanks go to my family for their love, support, and patience. To all of the amazing Changed Podcast Patreon page members who I couldn't do this without. Art of Change Skills for Life and Patreon member producer, Dr. Rick Kirshner. I'm Aiden Nepom, and I wish you the kind of experiences in life you're excited to tell stories about. Thank you.